Um, I came here in January and talked about uh, Lodash. Uh, I don't know how many people were with us then, but uh, um, I basically covered a presentation that's maybe 30 minutes and I cut it in half, um, or a third. Um, and I kind of went through some slides and, and uh, skipped a bunch of slides and hopefully made it so people can go look and, and find out more. But if you didn't, I'm back. I'm going to cover some more slides today. And for the ones that weren't here, I'm going to do like hyperspeed through the slides so you can see what you missed, but I won't waste uh, the others time. Uh, I'm Bob Holbin. I work up in Alpharetta at ADP by day, uh, writing Angular code. Um, I've only been in the JavaScript community about a year, um, but I love it. And I really, I'm pretty interested in Lodash, so um, it seems to be catching on with the presentations I was at the Angular group uh, last week doing it there as well. Last time we talked about why you use Lodash. Like I said, I'm going to fly through these slides because I don't want to do them again uh, in detail. But the history, we started with underscore uh, like six or seven years ago, maybe. And then that evolved into Lodash uh, as a fork off of underscore. Um, and John David Dalton created this, this uh, Lodash library, which has now become hugely popular. It's now the biggest MPM uh, uh, package that's dependent upon with, with all uh, with, with all applications out on the web and JavaScript. Originally, it was uh, driven by um, performance, but it's really a much more fully featured library. It's got a completely different uh, character and, and vision, I think, than, than underscore. Um, in January on the 12th, um, he released version 4 of Lodash, which is really kind of uh, the, the stepping stone, ultimately, to, to the reuniting of the underscore and Lodash libraries. And, and, uh, it's being called Underdash, um, and the, the vision that's being discussed that may not be executed very well is that v4 comes out, and it did in January. Underscore is supposed to have version 2 come out. Um, it hasn't come out yet, and ultimately both those things eventually merge back into something called Underdash. Um, based on the tone and, and the tweets and the conversations on GitHub, I'm starting to wonder. Now we're in March. This conversation started last May. And it's very controversial, and there's a lot of antagonistic comments that go between the two camps at, at times. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if this thing's ever going to emerge, but they're talking about it. I added one slide since the last time. Um, basically, uh, when do you use Lodash? There's a there's a really good article. It's got probably a thousand stars, I think, on GitHub. Um, it's kind of like one of these uh, jQuery articles that says, um, "Do you really need it? Do you really need Lodash? Do you really need jQuery?" Um, and and uh, there's a lot of comments and, and talk about this, but I, I kind of took that to heart and, and uh, wanted to say when I think you might think Lodash is appropriate is when you're working on something maybe that's more than a weekend project. If you've got uh, something where you're pulling in a, um, a reasonably decent sized framework, if you've got a lot of images, then, then 4K or 21K uh, file size probably isn't going to be that much of a difference. If you're doing something uh, quick and dirty, something small, something really high performance, then you're going to start getting particular about that. Keep the 21K number in mind. That's, that's the full kitchen sink build. Last time we talked about the looping constructs, which is really the heart of Lodash. And it's more than just looping through arrays. It's, a, it's looping through collections, which can be any iterable, like an array, an object, or a string, where you're, you're looping through character by character. I'm going to kind of buzz through this and just remind ourselves that there's really three reasons why you consider using the Lodash construct for uh, looping. The first one, which is really a weak argument these days, is if you have to support IE8, maybe you consider Lodash. If you don't, then it's not a good argument anymore because all the browsers will become considered compatible the modern ones. Uh, the second argument, which is a pretty decent argument for favoring Lodash, is uh, you can iterate not just through arrays, but you can iterate through any, like I say, collection, an array, of object, or string. There's also shorthand notations, which we talked about a little bit last time. And Lodash also allows you to exit out of an array or a loop early, instead of looping through 10, 100,000 items. If on the fifth pass you find what you need, you're not constrained to stick around. Um, performance, I'm going to skip to this slide. Basically says if you use Lodash, you're going to feel 
an 80% or more improvement in performance in your, uh, your times to execute your loops. This is a pretty good reason uh, to favor load ash. Um, and this slide presentation is online. It's on slides.com. I'll make sure I definitely put the, the link up. Um, all these yellow things are live links. You can click and go check the JS per stats. You can try it on your own computer, see what you find, but I found uh, like 80 to 89% of everything I checked with these four constructs. I'm going to skip the rest of this. Let's see. Well, I'm going to quickly go through has, get, and set again. We talked about this last time, where if you have an object structure, you're trying to dig through it. This is a pattern. I see a lot in code where there's a lot of logical land. You're just carefully navigating your way down into an object structure just to make sure that path really exists. If you find yourself doing this, ask yourself, should I be using Lodash instead of uh, data.response.apple.message? Maybe I do data.response.apple.message. It's, it's a kind of a strange uh, syntax to look at first. But once you start doing it, you'll start loving it. And has returns a Boolean. Yet, yeah, actually, this one line right here is equivalent to these five lines right there. So once you get familiar with this uh, kind of way of doing things, uh, your code can really get like that quite a bit. And on the reverse, um, we can do set. If you want to stick something into an object, like data, I forgot what the path was. I said data.parse.app.apple. So data.parse doesn't exist. So I'm like creating some nested structure within this object. Um, you know, you might do something like this in, in vanilla JavaScript. You might do something like this. Um, but if you use Lodash and you get familiar with this kind of stuff, it's tough. This is tough for people to see in the back put it down to the very bottom. But uh, you can use a one-liner there with the uh, underscore dot set. Okay, now I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, this is new stuff, I think, from last time. I don't think I covered this. Underscore dot is empty. I don't really care for the look of that line. All I want to do is find out if my array has any stuff in it. And if it doesn't, you know, do something may explode and, and throw an error. So this is a very common pattern to see all the time in code in JavaScript. Um, what I really would like to do to simplify, this is the ultimate, but I can't quite get there, is do something like this. But the language wasn't designed such that objects or arrays are falsy. They're not falsy, so I can't do that. Um, and this really prompted me. I sent a tweet to uh, Brendan Eich on this, and he responded. Um, I, I asked him, did he, did he ever uh, regret or wish that he designed those values to be false? And this is like, what, a 140-character long-winded answer, but he amazingly, just like his tweets always are, they pack all this stuff in there. But in the end, um, I'll take that as a yes. He wishes he could have. He couldn't in May 1995 because the, the wheels were moving forward. They found out they had to put the triple equals in, and he wanted to just replace the double equals, but this is where we have it today. Um, unfortunately, that's going back to my question. Um, this is what I really want to do, but I can't quite get there, so maybe the next best thing is something that's actually the same amount of text about as that, but it's a little bit more declarative. You can read it. Somebody who doesn't even know JavaScript can probably look at that and get a pretty good feel for what it's talking about. Um, so I kind of prefer that syntax. If I took it the next step, maybe I'll put my pull request into Lodash. I'd rather say uh, if uh, underscore has stuff, line array, instead of putting the negative bang on there. This is kind of a similar flavor. Um, I want to find out if uh, foo is in my array. This is the way I need to do it in vanilla JavaScript or some variant that's very close to this. I'd really like to see something simpler. Hey, it's foo in my array. Then do something. Can't quite get there. The language wasn't designed that way. So the next best thing is uh, Lodash makes it a little bit more readable. <coughs> if, if my array is in, includes foo, then do something. So that's the way it looks at Lodash. Not as compelling an argument, but um, more readable, I think. Lodash before version 4, which came out on January 12th, there was an <coughs> underscore dot contains method. Um, that's been deprecated, so now we've got includes, and there's no alias to it. So if you've got contains in your code, you'll uh, 
need to refactor. Should just be a fine and replace. So JavaScript string dot prototype that includes exists with ES6. Array dot prototype includes is about to go. Um, and underscore dot includes in Lodash. Um, you've got both those, plus you've also got the object. So the question begs, is it really a compelling reason to use Lodash? We're just about there to where it's built into the language. Almost fully to what I just described. The thing is with Lodash, underscore dot includes, what you're testing is the, the value. What you really want to test is the property in itself, most of the time. Testing for the value of an object maybe isn't that useful. And if you're testing for the property, you would use the built-in has own property or the in operator, typically depend upon if you're a product prototype chain or not. So my analysis in the end is underscore dot includes, maybe it's not worth the effort. Um, a year from now, I would say no. Maybe today is the transition. Next one is underscore dot first and underscore dot last. So if I've got an array here with some objects and they follow the same format, if I want to pluck out the first item in the array, I say users bracket zero. If I want the last item, I've got that darn dot, dot length thing again, so it's just kind of an eyesore for me. What I want to do is maybe something that backs off the, the backside or minus zero or something. Um, but I can't quite do that, it's not built in the language. So the next best thing using Lodash is uh, underscore dot first and underscore dot last. The first doesn't really buy anything from what you got by default as far as the number of characters. The last is nice. Um, but what you get if you start writing your code like this, again, it's very declarative, it's easy to read. All right, if you want to round a number, you can write your own utility function. It looks something like this. And you pass in a number, a floating point number, and you tell it how many digits you want to route it to. And uh, you know, the thing works pretty well. But why are you spending your time writing these utility functions? It's probably already been done before. It's in Lodash. So same sort of thing. Spend your time thinking about your actual code, what you're trying to accomplish rather than writing utility functions. <clears throat> the max value, you could reappropriate math.max to your array and grab the biggest number in this array. It's nice, but uh, John David Dalton, uh, Mr. Lodash says, if you do that in large arrays, depending on the, the different um, uh, engine running JavaScript, um, they'll have problems. Um, memory issues of some sort, so um, that could be a risky approach, and it's not the prettiest. You could be real clever and write a reduce function that goes through each loop and, and compares the previous and current value. Um, that's pretty cool, but instead of being clever, I'm going to just use Lodash. Now that was just going through an array of uh, numbers. But once you start using these utility libraries, um, you can start pulling out the max based on some property that you say. So in this case, I say, you know, look at the property age and pass me the, the max value. And then you get the whole object. Um, version 4 of Lodash has been a lot of deprecated and changed signatures and even changed method names. So, in version three, maybe you did dot max on this, but now it's dot max five. Let's talk about set theory. If I have an array that's got A, A, B, C, there's one array, I've got another array that's got B, C, D, E, so that's array two. Um, I want to find the union, the intersection. Everybody remembers this stuff from sometime in high school. It's been a while since I've been in high school. But, uh, come on, thanks. There's my little diagram. So array one and array two. First thing you can do is look at any 
single array and say, pare it down to just the unique values. So the first array has two A's. Well, let's, let's do just the unique values. This is, uh, in ES6, you can do this with, uh, by creating a new, an actual set uh, class on something, or a set instance. Um, but, it, but in ES6, for some reason, you don't get intersection and difference and union and all these other set operations. But you do have these in, in Lodash. And also, this is kind of the mindset. When you start using utility libraries, the, the, all these features that come with them, the more the community embraces and uses these things, this is how we find things in ES 2018 and 2019. So these kinds of things eventually going to make it into the language. But today, you can use it by using Lodash. Um, so Union, I think we kind of remember this, this cool stuff. So Union does uh, array one dot concat array two. And then it also throws a unique on top of that to, to get rid of the extra. Intersection, this is where my little charts that I put together like real late last night are starting to get weak, but we're just finding this section right here. So B and C are the only items that are in both. This is where my charts really fall off the wagon. I just don't have any graphic skills. But I'm trying to find the stuff out here, the stuff out here, and not the stuff in the middle. It's the opposite of intersection. So this is the symmetric difference. That's what XOR means um, when we get A, D, E. And then uh, the regular set difference, which is basically set A, or, or yeah, array A minus array, array one or minus array two. And in that case, we don't run the unique. I don't know why. It must have something to do with higher level math that's beyond it. Um, let's get into like pure prototypal uh, chain stuff. So. Um, some people, instead of uh, instantiating uh, off of classes, like to go the pure JavaScript route where you create an object and then you inherit the stuff into a second object. So here's the pedantic animal that can eat and poop, and then the dog has some stuff he can do. He can bark and howl on top of that. And the dog uh, inherits the animal, and then we just extend and keep adding more and more stuff in there. Um, that's object.create that was introduced in ES5. 2009, it's been around for a while. Um, it's not usually popular. The code just isn't nice and clean. I think the TC39 committee's not spent a lot of time trying to make this look as nice as it could. But uh, Lodash basically swapped out that one line right there. So that was, let me go back. So we had object.createAnimal, and then we would kind of outside and we just start tacking stuff on. But if we, if we clean up that line a little bit, now we've got underscore.create. Parameter one is animal, like before, but then there's a second parameter, and then the whole thing kind of, it has a nice balance to it. So you've got everything wrapped here, everything wrapped here, just, I think it's plainer looking too. Object composition. If you want to do the gang of four um, preferred composition over inheritance thing, um, sounds like a good idea. That way you can create your mythical uh, egg dog. Um, it's not something you could have conceived, but then all of a sudden you needed it again. Um, so, pig dog allows you, this is just basic uh, core um, JavaScript, but this is ES6, 2015. Um, you just, as your first parameter, uh, you pass in an empty object, and then all the stuff after that just gets piled in. So we're returning an object right here, we're returning an object right here, off those two calls, and then we're just creating an object that now has four methods. Oh, curly. So as I said, it's new in 2015. But if, if you don't have a transpiler or whatever, um, from what I understand, Chrome is what 91% compatibility with VS6. So this slide is already getting dated since I threw it together a month or two ago. Um, you can do underscore dot assign, and it's uh, you save yourself some characters. Um, there's not a huge strong argument for this one over the This slide I covered last time, I'm just going to blow through it. And this one I covered last time. But I'm going to, I've added one slide at the end. We talked about method wrapping, where you can pass the result of one call to a Lodash function, creates an array or, or a collection.
collection, you pass it to the next one, you pass it to the next one. So we filter here, <laughs> and then we run another filter, and then we store, we grab the first guy, and then ultimately we just grab the, the property out of the bits of string. So there's all these steps, but the code is uh, it's inside out. It's kind of tough to read. So we talked about last time, um, method scheme, and replacing all that code with something that looks like this. It's uh, left to right. It's not inside out. It's left to right. Or in the format I've put it in is top down. So much more readable. You go through one by one. And there's only one underscore. It creates this uh, wrapper object, this Lodash wrapper object, that ultimately you have to reveal in the end as an array or in the set case of string. So it improves readability, but the the killer feature is it's dramatic what it can do on performance. So we talked about 80% uh, improvement in performance earlier just by using Lodash on regular looping constructs. This is not 80%. This is what 8,000, 80,000%. 80, it's it's in some cases it depends on how you exit. Basically, it's taking all these uh, iterations. That's like a full iteration, another iteration, another iteration. It's taking the, the, this thing behind the scenes and collapsing it into one iteration if, if it can. And then it's exiting early again if it can. In the example I'm showing, this is not a 100x improvement because it's sort of, but depending on what you're doing. This is an excellent article to link to that will explain this much better than I do. This is the guy that wrote it and issued the PR to the Lodash library. It's built off of, the mentality came from lazy.js. So John David Dalton's mentality with Lodash has been to um, constantly stay really active in the community, find out what's popular, what people are doing. If there's some little libraries here that people are starting to go towards, he just pulls it into Lodash and has more and more on the top. So um, he's really attentive as far as I maintaining our libraries. So he caught wind of this presentation I was doing. He, he uh, sent me a note on Saturday night and said, Oh, you know, this is, maybe it's not the latest and greatest. There's some guy that wrote a, um, a blog last month that talked about um, maybe uh, method chaining is not the best. There's some more stuff. So if you're, if you would consider yourself a pure functional programmer, um, this is going to be interesting to you. I'm not yet, but this is, this is good stuff. And it was a long blog post. I want to throw it in here, but I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't fully understand how to digest it all day. But the, the overall intent of this is if you're writing a high performance library um, or, or, or app and it's small and that, uh, what was it, 21K? If that 21K library is starting to feel painful to you, then this is something that you're going to want to consider. Um, when you do method chaining, Lodash gives you all these abilities to uh, cut down and, and, and uh, customize the library to fit just your needs. You, you can pull just the four functions at 4K. You can add a few more functions, and maybe you're at 5K, 6K. You don't have to pull the whole kitchen sink at 21K. Um, but when you use method chaining, you're gaining performance in one way, but one thing you're losing is it's really difficult, the way it works, it's really difficult to prune the library down. It can be done, but it's, it's tedious. Um, so this, this article talks about, instead of even heading down that road, if you really, a 21K is bugging you, then this is something to consider. I'm going to skip these slides. That was from Angular Meetup. And this was my summary from last time. I'm going to end on this slide right here that just says uh, the same kind of thing as last time. Um, to learn Lodash, if you're not using it right now and you're interested, the docs are really good. Just go to the library, lodash.com, get the API docs, and open your console when you're in Lodash. Start reading. There's 300 functions in there. It's overwhelming at first. I've given you in this presentation about 20 to 25 if you look at them. Maybe these are some highlights. And they're broken down, listed by arrays and objects and strings. And you can sort of dig around and just start reading. 
And uh, this whole Barney and Fred thing, is, is, it comes from the Lodash library, so it's easy to look at examples. Um, and if you're curious, if you don't quite get the way something's working, just take the code from the, the example and paste it right in your console and start running with it. Plug and play and put your code in and just kind of learn. Um, it's, it's pretty good to pick up that way. That's all I have got for tonight. Um, any questions? Uh, really quick, does Lodash FD, where everything is queryable, does that have the same issues for modularity <coughs> that Lodash chain has? That article is specifically talking about how to do it with Lodash FD. And Lodash FP, remember I told you his mentality is basically pull all the cool stuff into his library so it just becomes the big agreement. Lodash FP is basically his answer to Ramda. So it's just the functional programmer's version of Lodash. Um, what I've given you, what I've talked about tonight is just the basic Lodash. The Lodash FP is like Ramda where you put your collections last. I've even heard of Lodash FP before. Yeah, don't ask me details on it. Yeah. <laughs>